everybody um, for joining. I can see there's a few more people who are coming in, but I'll make a start. Um, my name is Vic Wakefield Jarrett. Um, I'm a senior project worker in the local and community empowerment team at the Centre for Sustainable Energy. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Charlotte and Jack. Um, Charlotte, Jack, do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm I'm Jack Lloyd. I work in the Home Energy Services and a Retrofit team at the Centre for Sustainable Energy. Thanks, Jack. Charlotte, do you just want to say hello? Yeah. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Um, I work in the communications team at CSE as um, the communications project officer. Um, so um, we, uh, we've known from previous Green Open Homes events that CSE has experience of running. Um, that first-hand experience is really important in helping people beginning their own retrofit journeys. Um, so we're hoping uh, that these virtual events will help you to do just that the same way. Um, yeah, we made them virtual mostly because of coronavirus um, and we weren't sure whether it would be wise to have people traipsing around homes, but actually it's made it more accessible and we've got um, participants from all over the country with us here today. Um, so these events, we're looking to open discussion and share knowledge rather than recommending any particular measure or installers or brands of project products. Um, that's in part because every home will be different in how it's constructed and how you use it. So um, there's not one fit, one case fits all. But we hope that hearing the experience of our two example homes will be, um, you'll find it inspiring and hopefully helpful. Uh, we've themed tonight's webinar on older rural homes, uh, so built in 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, we've got two more webinars in this series, uh, looking at homes built, some terraced homes built in 1920s and 30s, and some more recent homes built in the 70s. Um, maybe my colleague can just share a link to those, uh, and we'll include it on the slides later. So just to say that this um, CSE applied for government community renewal funding through the West of England Combined Authority to run these webinars. Um, so we're grateful to them for enabling this important piece of work to take place. Uh, and a massive thank you to Alan and to Alan and John who've kindly volunteered to be part of this project um, and are joining us here today. Do you want to say hello, um, Alan and Alan and John? Hi. Do you want to unmute and just uh, just so we can see? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Excellent. Okay. Um, just gonna share my screen again. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to cover briefly cover a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, so for anyone unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, you might want to switch your viewing options to speak of you. Um, you should find the op an option for this on top right of your screen. Um, if you have any um, technical problems, feel free to uh, put them in the chat and hopefully my colleague Charlotte or Jack can pick them up um, uh, to, yeah, to help you out. Um, please remain muted uh, throughout the presentations. This just makes the sound clearer. Um, there's a microphone button is on the left hand le bottom left of your screen. Um, we want this to be useful. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box. If we've got time towards the end, um, then we might uh, we might invite you to unmute and speak. Um, but otherwise, please, yeah, please start by putting them in the chat box. Um, we've set aside some time for questions towards the end of the session. Uh, if, if we do have time, we might take some throughout as well. But we definitely have got a good 25 minutes at the end of the session for um, for questions. Um, and finally, just say this is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to be part of the recording, then you may wish to turn your camera off. Um, if you've got any concerns about this, please email us after the event. Um, so just to explain who CSE is, um, we are a charity that support people and organisations across the UK to tackle climate change and to end the suffering caused by cold homes. Uh, we do this by sharing our knowledge, practical experience and policy insights. For over 40 years, we've supported people to take effective action on energy in their homes. We help communities and local councils to understand energy issues, set priorities and put plans into action. And our research and analysis focus on making the energy system greener, smarter and fairer. Um, there's plenty more about CSE available on our website, which is cse.org.uk. Um, 
so this is uh, the agenda for today. Um, I've just done a quick welcome. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jack in a second uh, to take us through some of the principles of retrofit and he'll talk about future proof which is one of CSE's services. Then we'll move on to the two householder case studies. Um, these will uh, include a short video and then a few words from the householder and after that we'll move on to some Q&A. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, if I can find my Zoom controls. <laughs> And sorry, one second. I just excellent. Um, it's sorry, Jack Charlotte. Can you just confirm? Is my my screen still sharing? Or uh, no, it doesn't no. Okay, well. excellent. Um, okay, sorry. Um, I'm just. Just before we kick off, I'm going to just um, launch a poll just to ask you a bit question, few questions about just one question about um, why you've attended today and uh, yeah, what your motivations are. So you should see this pop up on your screens. Um, if you could just uh, select one of those options so we can see who we've got in the room and why they're looking to join today. Excellent, everyone's taking part. Great, okay. A um, couple more people coming in. Okay, I'm just going to end it now. Um, don't worry if you haven't been able to answer it. So it's really interesting to see that most people on the call are really keen to, to do retrofit, but haven't started. Um, some of you have installed some missions and are keen to do more, um, but a lot of you are thinking about it. That's interesting. Two people on the call aren't homeowners. Um, we do have some advice on our website for people who rent their homes or um, and stuff you can do on that. So do feel free to contact us if you want more information around that. Excellent. OK, um, Jack, I'm going to hand over to you now to take us through Future Proof. OK, great. Thanks very much. I'll just uh, try and share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Uh, yeah, there you go. Excellent. Yeah, See looks that. good. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what Future Proof is um, as a service within the Centre for Sustainable Energy and just the basic principles of retrofit. And yeah, I, I work within the retrofit team as a retrofit assessor. Um, so yeah, I, and I'll speak a little bit more about what that means in a mo. So Oh, can I put, yep, there you go, next slide. Um, so yeah, Future Proof is the retrofit advice service provided by the Centre for Sustainable Energy. And the project's aim is to provide a service uh, that supports homeowners who have the desire and capital to improve the energy efficiency of their homes, but who need independent advice along uh, various different stages of their retrofit journey. So hopefully that's something that could help um, some of you potentially uh, based on that poll. Um, but yeah, the future proof advice mainly concerns the thermal energy efficiency uh, of the property and thus focuses on insulation measures and low carbon heating. But it can also advise more generally on sort of solar PV and, and micro generation. But uh, yeah, why do we need to, um, to make our homes more energy efficient? So I'm sure most of you already sort of know the basics of this, but um, just a quick look at some of the statistics around it. So 14% um, of the total UK greenhouse gas emissions are actually from household energy use. So that's the electricity that we use in our homes and space and water heating. Uh, and that's equivalent to the emissions from all UK aviation and waste combined. So it is a significant chunk of our, um, our UK national greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the UK has some of the worst performing housing stock in Europe with 45% of our existing dwellings are rated at uh, an energy performance certificate band D uh, and 19% rated as E or lower. And since approximately 80% of all our buildings that will be in use in 2050 are already built, it's clear that we you know, need to improve the energy efficiency of our current building stock if we have any hope in uh, achieving our net zero targets. So um, some basics of retrofit. 
Um, yeah, the term retrofit itself just means installing a newer feature into an older product. So it doesn't have to be necessarily related to uh, buildings. But in the context of buildings, it's sort of become shorthand for low carbon or sustainable retrofit. Um, with the main aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve the sustainability and comfort of, um, of buildings. So the best practice approach to retrofitting buildings is what's called the whole house approach. Um, and that's where all the proposed interventions are considered together in the building's context to ensure that all the measures are suitable for that property and do not uh, adversely affect each other. So uh, why, why the whole house approach? Um, it might, might seem a little bit obvious, but yeah, the current condition of a property needs to be considered uh, because you don't want to lock in problems or make them worse. Issues such as damp due to condensation could be made uh, worse by adding internal warning insulation, for example. So it's always best practice to fix existing issues um, before you do anything else. Uh, you also have to consider that the order of measures. So for example, if you're planning on getting solid wall insulation, but you also need to replace your windows fairly soon, it's a good idea to get the windows replaced first as removing them once you've already installed the wall insulation could risk damaging it. Um, and third bullet point on this slide, uh, just gives some examples of uh, different different things you might have to consider. Um, so, if you increase the, can we see the slides um, in your in your property, you may also increase, or you're likely to increase the air tightness of that property. And so, with that, uh, it's usually necessary to increase or, or manage better the um, deliberate ventilation provided by by extract fans and things like that to to avoid condensation buildup and mold growth. Um, you also need to consider the vapor permeability of the existing building fabric. For example, if you've got a solid masonry wall, which is designed to be vapor permeable, it's best practice to use an insulation material that's also vapor permeable, as this will allow the building to breathe, meaning that moisture will be able to move through the building fabric in and out. Uh, and for listed or heritage properties, um, you may face planning restrictions and therefore have to work around these. So these are all, these are all examples of why um, you need to take the whole building into account rather than just specifying a sort of one size fits all solution. Um, yeah. So where to start? Um, so alongside the whole house approach is also the fabric first approach or the energy hierarchy, um, which you can see here is the sort of upside down um, pyramid on the screen. So the main principle here being that you first want to reduce the amount of energy that you use through sort of simple changes in behavior in your home. So that's the energy conservation stage. And then you want to improve the energy efficiency of your building fabric and the appliances and heating systems before finally thinking about adding renewable energy generation to your home. Uh, it's often very tempting for homeowners to think of renewables such as solar PV first, but actually the most climate friendly thing that you can do is use one less unit of energy rather than generate one low carbon unit of energy. Although obviously generating low carbon energy is also very good. Um, so if you live in the West of England, you can call uh, CSE's advice line for tips on how to conserve energy in your home or for information on grant funding for um, different retrofit measures. Uh, and this line, calling this line is completely free. Uh, if you don't qualify for any of the grant funding, um, Futureproof can help those who are able to pay um, to, to make decisions on their, on their retrofit project. Um, but actually having said that, uh, as you'll see later on our grant slide, um, there are some which aren't means tested, so that should be available to everyone. Uh, so how does Futureproof help as a service? Um, so we've got various different services which are on the, on the slide now. So the introductory retrofit guide, uh, this goes through the sort of basic principles of retrofit for clients at the start of their journey. Um, and with this service, one of our advisors will provide a telephone consultation regarding the client's property and discuss the different measures that are likely to be appropriate. The client will then be sent a summary report with information on all of the measures discussed. And moving on to the full survey and retrofit coordination plan, uh, that's a sort of much more detailed report where one of our trained retrofit assessors, uh, such as myself, will visit the property and take various measurements of the building and the insulation materials uh, with a view to building a mathematical heat loss model uh, on a computer. Uh, and this baseline model seeks to emulate the heat loss of a property. Uh, and then different hypothetical retrofit scenarios can be modeled on top of this so the client can see how much energy uh, they would save with each scenario. 
Uh, after this, a report will be, then be produced that gives an overview of the client's project brief, the existing condition of the property, an outline of the proposed retrofit scenarios, a summary of the specific measures that uh, are necessary to achieve those scenarios, and a final section on next steps. And then moving on sort of later down the line with your retrofit project, um, there's planning appeal advice. So if you've already applied for planning permission for home improvements and been refused, you can get advice on how and when to appeal these decisions from our expert planning consultant based at CSE. There's also our project management service where CSE can help with coordinating contractors and ensuring sort of high quality of works with those. Uh, there's also on-site inspection and sign-off. So that's where our qualified retrofit, uh, one of our qualified retrofit coordinators can uh, come to your property and uh, inspect an installation and sign this off to say that it's um, you know, of a high standard. Uh, and if a client purchases any one of these uh, services, they also have access to uh, what we call the, the Future Proof Associated Builders List. Uh, and that's just a, li a list of builders and service providers who've undertaken training in the sustainable retrofit of buildings. So we sort of trust, trust those, um, those providers to give a good service. So a little bit about grants that are available. Um, boiler upgrade scheme uh, is, is uh, the one that I was mentioning before. So it's a new government scheme that provides up to 5,000 pounds off a new uh, source heat pump or 6,000 pounds off a new ground source heat pump. Um, the scheme isn't means tested and it's applied for by the installer. The only major requirement is for the property to have a valid EPC, uh, which is an energy performance certificate, uh, and that EPC should have no recommendations for further wall insulation. So if you have cavity walls and they're filled, or you've got solid walls and you've got either internal or external wall insulation, then you should be eligible for the grant. Um, you've also got the Home Upgrade Grant, uh, which is a national government scheme where money is applied for by local authorities and then distributed um, by the local authorities onto householders. Uh, this scheme, unfortunately, is only available to properties that do not have a gas connection, uh, but they, and they also need to have an EPC rating of D or lower. Uh, the lower your EPC score, the more money you are potentially entitled to. Um, but this is, this is a means tested grant. So the household, uh, the household in, total have to earn less than 30,000 uh, pounds annually to qualify. Um, but there's lots of different measures that are available under this scheme. Um, solid wall insulation, cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, floor insulation, uh, double glazed high performance windows, air source heat pumps, solar PV. Yeah, quite, quite a lot of different measures are available. Uh, finally, the Energy Company Obligation, or ECO, is a policy which mandates energy providers to uh, donate uh, an amount of money to improve the efficiency of fuel-poor households. Uh, it's mainly uh, geared to those who are on a range of different benefits, uh, but it can also be accessed even if you're not in receipt of benefits, if you pass certain criteria, which confusingly does change depending on which local authority you belong to. So. Um, if you're in the west of England, you can call CSE's advice line for more information on that. Um, yeah, we also have uh, a bit of money off uh, at the moment for some of our future proof retrofit surveys um, with rates changing depending on where you live within Wecker and Somerset. Um, I think there's still some available in South Gloucestershire and, and Somerset in general. So uh, unfortunately, I do think that Bristol has, uh, has run out of um, the subsidies, though. Um, just a bit about finding contractors. So there's the, um, it, you know, people find it quite difficult to find contractors to do their retrofit work, and it's even harder to find those that people can trust. Um, but the National Insulation Association and the Microgeneration Certification Scheme, uh, with their um, websites here, um, they have sites where you can search for installers, but they also certify um, those who are registered to them, so you can guarantee a sort of a high level of quality. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, National Insulation Association, you can kind of guess um, which kind of contractors they um, promote, but the microgeneration certification scheme, uh, that they, they have a, a wide array of installers of different sort of low carbon technologies, solar PV, wind power, heat pumps, battery storage, uh, and more. If you don't live in the West of England, there's also uh, similar organizations or projects um, to future proof. So 
Seven Y Energy Agency covers sort of Gloucestershire and Y Valley areas. Uh, Carbon Co-op sort of Greater Manchester area, and there's the Future Fit Homes, uh, which covers uh, London. And um, that's not an exhaustive list, obviously, but that's just a few that we're aware of. Um, yeah, and that's basically the end of uh, my short presentation. But um, here are some of our details, so you can see our our future proof services on on the website on the screen. Um, and yeah, you can you can call the number on there or email our email our email address um, if you are interested in any of the services. But yeah, thanks very much. I'll just stop sharing my screen now. And um, yeah, I wasn't sure if are we going straight on or are we going to have some questions? There? Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody, I've not seen any in the chat that are, um, that are specific to this one. Um, other than uh, do you, um, sorry, do your do organisations um, in other parts of the country offer this service? Um, does Future Proof cover Wiltshire, Jack? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it does. It does. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so um, hopefully you can see uh, my slides now, um, which just gives us a bit of details about um, Alan's home. Uh, Alan's kindly agreed to um, participate uh, today um, and we're going to start by showing you a short video we made um, just to clarify that for the agenda we're going to go through these two homes and we'll, we'll cover all the questions at the end please do continue um, putting them in the chat um, so uh, yeah let me I'm just going to um, share the video of got too many too many windows open sorry <laughs> um, okay stop sharing for one second um oh i can see that somebody's got their hand raised Does, um do you want to the person who has their hand raised do you want to just unmute and ask your question Are they, oh no, they yeah um okay is that peter? Me? yes yep yeah, go ahead peter thank you yeah um i've tried out a, a thing that um which is at simple energy, energy advice dot org they they offer um, an algorithm which takes input rather like that for an EPC for your mm -hmm. house and offers um, a number of retrofit interventions with estimates of how much you might have to spend and what you might save. I wonder if someone could comment on whether they think that particular algorithm is of any use because I have been suggesting to people that they should at least try it out. Um, Jack, I don't know if you've come across that particular. I haven't um, actually tool. come across this, so I wouldn't be able to comment on whether it's you know valid or useful. But um, yeah, it sounds like it should be. <laughs> okay. The point being that you you have an algorithm, and uh, which you therefore um, understand the, the mechanics of, and there is an alternative which may or may not be any good. So that, that's why I raised the question. Thank you. Um. Right, okay, I'm just going to share a video now. We did try this earlier and um, apologies if the the um, the quality isn't great um, of everybody trying to access uh, the video through Zoom. It's, yeah, it might be a little low quality. So I'll, I'll start it now. Um, if it is terrible quality, do let me know and we can just show you the link instead of trying to share it through Zoom. My name's Alan Pinder and I've lived in this house for 30 years or so in Thornbury and over that time we've done quite a lot of bits and pieces, uh, energy efficient stuff, partly because uh, we're concerned about the environment and we want to save energy but also because we're aware that energy prices are going up and sooner or later we're not going to be able to afford it so better to invest in energy saving measures earlier on rather than later and then we've done various energy improvements since then solar panels uh, external uh, insulation to make the stone walls more efficient uh, bits of double glazing so 
we, here we have uh, quadruple glazed windows which happened almost by accident because the original windows which we wanted to keep because they were historic uh, were single glazed and drafty so these, these front rooms were really cold so we got a carpenter to make these double glazed shutters for us which are pretty efficient and they're double glazed so that solved a lot of the problems and then when we had the house um, we did a, a whole refit scheme when we did the external insulation and various other measures um, they had the facilities to make wooden sliding sash windows that were similar not the same but similar to what we had before so we said let's do that as well to replace the old windows which were starting to fall apart so it means we've ended up with quadruple glazing which is really efficient so we installed when, when we did the insulation and sealed everything up we found in the following years that we were getting really serious condensation um, and this was a problem things were going moldy in the cupboards and so on so what we decided to do was to install uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, which is quite a complicated thing to say. Uh, but all it's doing is it's a combination of extractors and ventilation. And what the, the end uh, result is that we have um, blowers like this through the upstairs and one downstairs that blows clean warmed air into the house. And in the bathrooms, we have extractors uh, which suck out the, the moist air. So when we originally did the house up, one of the problems that we had was there was no damp proof courses. And uh, we thought that while we were doing, doing the house up um, 25 years ago, we would relay the floors with damp proof courses throughout. And one of the things we've learned is that when we do improvements and, and maintenance and things on the house, that's a brilliant time to actually do energy improvements as well. So while we had the floor up and the builders were in here doing all the work, we got them to put uh, four inches of insulation underneath the floor, which at that time was the most insulated bit of the house, but it's not something we're ever going to do again. So uh, we took the opportunity to do it while we could. Probably the best thing we've done has been the solid wall external insulation. Um, we don't have cavity walls, we're not energy efficient in that way. And there's lots of houses in the country that are not, don't have cavity walls. And it's made a huge difference. It cut our bills by half. And um, we've it, it transformed the house from being a cold drafty place to uh, a, a warm and snug and cosy and, and it's brilliant. So I would always recommend um, insulation rather than solar panels and um, heat pumps and things like that, which uh, sort of you do further down the line. So insulation and insulation, insulation is the, what I would recommend. Excellent. Um, thanks so much uh, for agreeing to be filmed, Alan. That was great. Um, Alan's with us today. Uh, do you want to add anything, Alan, about the, your retrofit journey or how you're finding the house to live in now? Uh, well, I think we've. it's been good fun doing it, all the, all the stuff that we've done. We've done quite a lot of things over the years. Um, the, in the video, when you came around to do the video, we still had scaffolding up from replacing the the solar panels which is now all all gone but the solar panels are still not working but um uh yes yeah, so I, I i would stick with the do the insulation stuff first and and uh, um and then do whatever you can after that great thank you um we've got a couple of minutes if anyone has a question specifically for for Alan's property. Oh, there's one here actually about, um, did you set yourselves an air tightness target before installing mechanical ventilation and heat recovery? No, we didn't. Um, 
when we did the retrofit, we, we had a big scheme. We were, we were part of a big scheme uh, to retrofit the house and the air tightness was measured, but we never saw the results of that. So no, we didn't. Um, but we have insulated the chimneys. Uh, we've got draft, draft proofing all around. We've got a front porch. So it was, uh, we, we did the ventilation because of um, the condensation that we were getting. So we didn't really have any other options for solving that problem. It needed solving, so we had to do it. Um, thank you. Um, there's a few questions about this uh, mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, actually. Um, so did you install it yourself? Did you get a contractor? How, is it, how, so how did you find one? Um, yeah, just talk a little bit more about that. It seems people are quite interested in the in experience of it. And how yes. much did it cost? Yes, it, it cost me about a thousand pounds. I did I did do it myself. So the thousand pounds was for the ducting and um, the heat exchanger, heat exchanger and fan units. Uh, just over a thousand pounds it cost. I think you probably if you had a contractor in to do it, you'd be talking two to three times as much as that. Um, we did look at other options rather than a whole house system. Um, which is a fair amount of money to do that. We looked at, there are, you can get um, systems that, that blow air into the bedrooms from the loft and they warm the, that air electrically. Uh, and then you can have um, heat exchanging extractors in the kitchen and think all, all sorts of bits and pieces like that. And we looked at uh, the salesman came and, and suggested three bits of kit uh, doing that with this and there's no um, because it's electrically heated the air that's coming in you're not using the all the extracted air uh, is is the heat in that is is wasted to some extent so and that was going to cost as much as the materials for doing the um, the system that we had, uh, just the, the bits of kit. So we decided to that I would do that rather than buy the little bits and pieces and, and have a, a less good system. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to pause the questions there to allow us to move on to the other, um, which is Alan and John's home. Um, and uh, do keep your questions. We'll, we'll pick some questions up um, after, towards the end um, for both the homes. Um, so yeah, we're joined today by Anne and John. Uh, they live in a detached house outside Bath, built in around 1905, um, which has a ex later extension. Um, and you can see the list of measures they've taken there. So again, I'm just going to share um, their video. So bear with me one second. Um, Hi, my name's John. And I'm Anne, and we live in a detached house just outside Bath. We've lived here for 32 years, and the house dates back to the early 1900s. And uh, we wanted to try and tackle our carbon footprint. Uh, and as part of that, we've embarked on a project a couple of years ago to uh, install a heat pump to replace our oil fire boiler, uh, install solar panels and, and a battery. Um, and that was all installed about a year ago. OK, so this is our heat pump. Um, it's a Valent Aerotherm Plus, I think it's a 12 kilowatt model. Um, it's incredibly quiet, we were amazed how quiet it, it was. Uh, much, much quieter than the old oil-fired boiler used to be. Um, and uh, it uh, seems to heat the, the water um, as hot as, as the old boiler used to, if you want it to. It runs more efficiently at a lower temperature, so its, it's design temperature is 50 degrees, I think. These are our solar panels. Um, we built this uh, garage 
uh, with a view to optimising uh, the possibility of getting uh, solar panels. And as you can see, we've got this edge-to-edge -edge solar panel system. We managed to find a company in Cardiff uh, who could do this system. Um, and I think it looks great. So our motivation for doing all of this work, um, we really wanted to tackle our, our um, carbon footprint. And the most difficult is has been converting from uh, what was an oil-fired boiler to uh, a heat pump with solar panels, etc. Uh, the primary thing to tackle was um, to replace our oil-fired boiler. We wanted to stop burning oil. Um, so the heat pump was the, was the primary thing that we wanted to do. Uh, the solar panels, obviously, um, uh, would be great, the idea of being able to generate our own renewable power. And then we installed a battery because we wanted to make full use of that power, didn't we? A no-brain solution to how we would be able to charge the car and use electricity at really good rates. But we did have a few problems. I mean, we had um, the roof designed to maximise the space that we had on the garage, and that would, in theory, provide us with 5.8 kilowatts of energy. But when we applied to the district network operator, they basically said that the infrastructure that allowed um, power to get to where we live wasn't sufficient, wasn't strong enough, and so they reduced the amount that we could actually supply back to the network to 3.8. Kilowatts. Yeah, frustratingly you have to apply to the district network operator for all of these things. You have to apply, or at least your installers apply on your behalf, for the heat pump, for the uh, solar panels, for the battery, uh, even for the uh, electric car charger. Uh, the actual um, work involved with the installation I think most of the disruption was actually caused by uh, us doing our own insulation before the work started because we had to remove some um, ceiling panels uh, in order to insulate between the rafters. I think our advice to anybody else who might want to do a similar installation uh, would be um, be patient and be um, persistent and tenacious, but it is worth it. I mean, it's fantastic um, to feel that your carbon footprint is as low as it could be. Excellent. Thanks to Anne and John for allowing us to film their home. Um, yeah, do you want to, Anne, John, do you want to unmute and um, add anything if you want to or about your experience? I think the only thing that I would um, add is that, uh, like Alan, we did a lot of work uh, on insulation, which isn't really covered in the video particularly. Um, the house uh, was built in 1906. Uh, a lot of it is solid stone walls. So there's a limit to how much insulation you can do. Um, but we did some internal wall insulation um, uh, in the bedrooms where uh, that had the solid walls. And you do lose a little bit of living space um, when you do that. Um, but those rooms were very cold before and, and now they're much, much better. We also um, had bedrooms that were in the eaves of the building um, so sloping roofs, sloping ceilings. So we had to take the ceilings down in order to access the rafters and get insulation in between the rafters. Uh, we had an old um, hundred year old straw in between the rafters, which was the only thing that the builders had put in uh, by way of insulation. So it was a pretty filthy job uh, and fairly unpleasant, but because we largely did it ourselves, uh, other, than the, other than the plastering at the end, uh, it was it, it, for us. It was only the cost of the materials, and well worth it. Um, I think if we hadn't done that, it would have been difficult to go on and do the other things. And the other thing I'd add, again, which isn't covered in the in the video, is um, cost. We didn't we didn't set out to do this in order to save money. Um, we set out to do it because we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint. But I have to say, in the year that we've been running the heat pump now, we've actually saved a huge amount of money 
and we have the benefit of the solar panels, so we're generating some of our own power. But our total energy bill is going to be something like one third of what it was before. So, so it's still going to take 12 to 15 years to pay for the cost of the work, but it is significantly saving us money. I would say be tenacious as well. You know, um, I didn't do a lot of this work, but John worked for a couple of years before we started on the project, trying to find people to supply the bits that we wanted, to do the bits we wanted, to do them in the way that we wanted. And, you know, hopefully the industry's got much better now because obviously it has to if there's that many people that are going to be doing this type of work, which we have to if we're going to meet our targets. But it was a lot of work. It was quite a hard grind to get to conclusions. I don't know whether Alan found the same. Um, but, you know, you kind of feel as though there has to be a better way. There must be better directories, which um, I think you've sort of alluded to in terms of the MCS index or the MCFS registration. But again, it's still quite hard to plow your way through that because those people seem to come and go at the moment and supply or don't supply on a whim. So yeah, don't yeah. give up, it's worth it. We had we had something like six or seven different quotes for a heat pump and uh, really of varying standards, even though they were all MCS registered. <laughs> uh, and some of them came out and did a whole, whole house survey, some of them didn't. Um, some of them recommended, you know, very different sizes of heat pump or outputs of heat pump. Um, so they, their calculations vary. Um, I think it's difficult to go into this if you think you're going to be able to outsource the conclusions that are driven from it. You've really got to be, in, be prepared to be involved in it, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's really useful. And um, there's a couple of questions about the insulation. Do, what what type of insulation did you use? And do you know the material that it was? We just used Celotex. So we've got a hundred mil of Celotex between the rafters, and then we put twenty five mil over the top, so as to kind of seal the rafters from the room, so there's no cold bridging. And we just used uh, twenty five mil bat um, plasterboard as our internal wall insulation, so as to not lose too much space in the room. Great, thank you. Um, just, um, I'm just going to uh, go through one or two more, a couple more slides just um, to tell you a little bit more about the programme, mainly that we've got two other webinars coming up and then we're going to move on to questions. So let me just share this. Um, sorry, one moment. Um, okay. Apologies, I should have prepped this in advance. Um, okay, so just, um, just to, yeah, let you know that we've got, um, two more webinars coming up in this series. Um, they are, as I mentioned before, uh, one's looking on Monday evening, one will be looking at two 1970s terraced homes in Bristol. No, sorry, not in Bristol. Um, so let me start that again, apologies. So the one on Monday is looking at two 1970s homes. Uh, one is in Thornbury and one is in rural northeast Somerset. Um, and then on Thursday, the 23rd of June, going to be looking at two detached homes in Bristol um, from the 1920s and 30s. Um, for those of you that are local to Bristol, um, we're also holding an information stall on uh, Saturday the 25th of June at Future Leap on Gloucester Road. Um, information about all of that can be found um, on that link which um, we can share in the chat. Um, <coughs> um, just to say we will also be um, yeah, sharing uh, some information after the call, after all of the webinars um, have been completed, we will be sharing um, a link to the recordings of the webinars uh, and also some useful facts covering any of the main points that have been raised. Um, so we'll try and include any questions, uh, any answers to any questions in that. Um, right, next slide. Uh, yeah, so now we're going to move on to any questions. Um, I'm just stop just sharing my for any questions. Um, oh, someone just. Oh, uh, before we do that, I'm just going. I've just noticed that David 
uh, has joined us, David Simmington. You um, was going to be one of our uh, showcase homes, but unfortunately, uh, he was out of the country at the time that we were doing the filming, so we weren't able to include him in the films. David, did you want to say anything about your retrofit experience briefly, just um, so people could also ask you questions? Uh, do, you, do you want to unmute yourself and just say, yeah, they could just say something about your house? Yeah, no, thank you very much for the people who have shown us their homes. It's been very, very interesting, and it covers a lot of the... Uh, factors that we're all going to have to take into account and I really liked a bit about um, going heavily onto insulation before thinking of um, alternative energy sources. I have um, uh, uh, an air source heat pump and I also have uh, panels on the roof, uh, PV panels on the roof and I hope to next go on and get a battery and I was very interested to see um, Anne and John's Tesla battery, because the idea of recycling car batteries is a really good idea, you know, electric car batteries, and also if you can get an electric car to use them. That would be my next stage. I just did want to ask them uh, about their air source heat pump. Mine also is a valent, slightly smaller than theirs, only seven kilowatts. But um, although I find the air source heat pump excellent at producing lots of hot water and the cistern inside the home excellent the bit of the system that i am least happy with is the controls and i would like to ask them if they also have found it very frustrating the complexity and sophistication of the controls um it's uh, you have to approach a heat pump and i'm sure you've had the same experience in a different way to uh, an oil or gas fired boiler, you tend to run it at a lower temperature for a longer time. Um, so it just keeps tripping over. So um, you, what we find once we've got it set up, we don't do anything at all to manage it on a day to day basis. It, it just looks after itself and it seems to be very effective at doing that. And the one we've got, maybe it's a, a later model than yours, it's got a a really, I, I find it a very simple interface as a kind of mobile thing that you carry around that it's, you put it in whatever room you want to and it, and it uh, measures the temperature in that room and, and you set the temperature you want and, and it just takes care of, um, of the heat pump to deliver the room to that temperature. And it's amazing how um, when it's running, the rooms pretty much bang on that temperature. They seem to hardly ever vary. And when it's cold outside, um, the hot water in the radius is much hotter. When it's warm outside, the, the radius is much cooler. So it compensates for the weather. Um, and then of course, it's a lot less efficient when it's cold. Um, so it's more expensive for those few months when it's cold, um, but uh, very efficient when it's warm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, there was a few more questions for you in the chat, um, John and Anne, if you're happy to, to answer them. Um, some people were asking about um, if you change your radiators when you fitted your air source heat pump. Um, we, had often, we had various quotes. Most people said we would have to change all our radiators. Actually, we went with a company that said we wouldn't have to change any radiators. <laughs> and uh, we, we sort of went we took the approach that we would try um, running it for a winter without changing the radiator and uh, and see whether it kept the, warm, the house warm enough. Uh, and it did. Um, so um, we didn't change any radiators. Having said that, uh, we're changing some now for other reasons because we're making some other changes to the house. So we've taken the opportunity to, to change one or two of the radiators and uh, go for slightly bigger ones. Uh, the plan being to uh, run the heating system at a slightly lower temperature and therefore use bigger radiators to get the same heat into the, into the house. And therefore, in theory, run the system more economically, more efficiently. But I, but I don't think we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't feel as though we had to um, no. change them. We, I think our conclusion was um, we didn't believe that we'd have to change all of the radiators and that it's a bit of a, a bit of a myth, maybe forcing people to do all of that at the outset. Um, 
you know, there's marginal benefits to be had from changing some radiators, but there's a hell of a cost associated with changing those radiators as well, which we didn't simply want to go into blind. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and we also had a question um, for you about um, the contractors that you used. Um, did you use different ones and um, did you find that um, easy or was there any problems with um, using different contractors? Well, there are different specialisms. So we used one contractor for the heat pump, another one for the solar panels, another one for the, um, the battery. Um, so there are each different specialisms. But it was good in that um, if you put the battery in at the same time as the solar PV, then you only need to pay 5% VAT on the battery. If we'd done it at separate times, it would be 20% VAT, which is quite a lot on that battery. And they communicated with each other to make sure that we could get the best outcome for yeah. us on, yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess we were lucky there. Um, but yes, because we kind of found them all ourselves. They all worked independently of each other. The advantage of that is, I suppose, you have ownership of that relationship. The disadvantage of that is they slag off each other because they don't have any relationship with each other. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a few quite specific questions coming through. Um, I think there was one, sorry, I'm just going back through the chat here. Um, I think there was one for you, Alan, um, about the um, mechanical ventilation heat recovery. Um, do you have any useful guides online? Um, like for example, where to position the cold feeds and the hot extracts? Sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry. Um, it was just about your um, mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know of any useful guides like online for people to figure out what's going to be the best? Uh, I don't. I, um, I, uh, I, I worked it out from the what the manufacturers of the of the equipment. There's only really one major manufacturer of the of the boxes um, and the, they do really good quality stuff um, and the, there's loads of stuff on their website um, I can't remember off the top of my head who they what their name of the firm is but um, uh, I'd have to I'll have to think about that but um, yes it, it probably I, I was starting virtually from nothing uh, from not knowing anything and not having any information. And I managed to find most of what I needed, but um, it, it is quite a technical thing. And uh, if you can find somebody that knows about it, then, then that's probably a good thing to do. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so there's quite a few specific questions in the chat, which maybe we might be able to answer um better later on um i was just wondering if anyone um wanted to ask a question directly um because i think we've kind of got through most of the ones in the chat um so if anyone wants to like raise their hand um just to say that you can raise your hand either um on the reactions icon which should be on the bottom ribbon of your toolbar or also if you click on the participants um <clears throat> participants list and find yourself uh, then there should be an option there to raise your hand uh, marina has a question i think do you want to unmute marina and ask your question yeah uh, we were interested in um whether i mean we put this question in the chat whether people have got experience of um trying to double glaze without replacing the windows, i.e. putting um, new double glaze units in existing sashes, which um, uh, means that you don't have to, you can, you know, you can retain the sashes, particularly if, they're, if, they, if they look good and also it's a bit less work. I mean, specifically, we were, um, I, I was looking at this type of glass called Landvac, um, which is, 
very thin and it's based on uh, it's based on a vacuum uh, between it which is kept apart by these invisible spaces it, it sounds sort of too good to be true and I would be just very interested as to whether or not anybody had come across it or had used it or knew anything about it Um, Alan, do you want to talk a bit more about your experience of your windows? Because I know that you. Yes, um, I mean, I, I had the, uh, the double glazed shutters, um, which weren't ideal because they, they, you can see them from the outside. So we wanted to keep the, the old historic windows at that time, um, but improve the, their efficiency. And the, the chap who did it for us was just a, a, a jobbing. Uh, joiner and he he made them and and he did quite a good job they made them fit really really neatly um, but as I say that they, they were visible from the outside and then uh, in a couple of years after that the the old windows fell fell apart so uh, so we gave up with that idea and, and had some new windows but the it it would be possible it there's there's all sorts of difficulties um, there's all sorts of things. It means you can't, if you have shutters on the inside, it means you can't put anything on the windowsill. Uh, it can interfere with the curtains and all the blinds or whatever you've got inside. Um, so you have to think carefully about the design of it. Um, and they're, they're quite sort of big, chunky things, the, the ones that we had, to, in order to get them to, to fit tightly. So, um, there, there were disadvantages as well as advantages. I think that about sums it up. Um, oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have their hand up? Oh, sorry, Kenneth. Yeah, David seems to be waving. That was you waving at us. Can you go ahead, David? Um, I'm not sure if we can hear you. No, I think it, I think it looks like he's trying to find them. Good, the thanks. Sorry, the host had to unmute me. Uh, just a point, I had um, double glazed glass put into my existing sash, wooden sash windows on my Victorian house. So what he did was a carpenter took out the old glass and then routered out the slot all the way around to make it deeper and then inserted relatively thin um, double glazing units. And that was quite straightforward. He did a number of sashes like that. And while you have the sashes out, you can put all in the little fuzzy strips that completely uh, stop them being um, uh, uh, drafty. The only gap you're left with is where the, the ropes go up and down, the sash cords go up and down. That has to be filled in somehow. But the little fuzzy strips are really good at cutting out dra drafts. I would make a point though that when you put in a double glazed unit into an existing sash window, you double the weight of the sash. Therefore, the counterbalancing weights on the other end of the sash cords have to be also made heavier, which is very, very difficult because they're in little uh, tight squares in uh, little uh, slots that they slide up and down. And if you put, if you put a bit of lead on them, they'll get stuck. When you put it at the head, the lead on the top of the iron uh, counterweight, they'll hit the pulley before the window is fully down, and vice versa if you put it on the bottom. So that's, I'll just raise that as an issue if you're trying to um, double glaze existing sash units. Can I ask a question? It's to Jack. He, he made a, a passing comment on his uh, presentation, which was that uh, when you take a whole house approach, is the heat loss of my property too high for a heat pump? And I just, that's um, because um, uh, Anne and John made reference to one of the myths about air source heat pumps. And this is another one that I've been, a number of people have said to me that they've been told they can't have an air source heat pump or it would be unsuitable for their property because they have solid walls. And I'm just saying, well, that's because your house is colder. And if a heat pump doesn't produce water as hot as a gas 
boiler, then you might not be um, getting enough heat into the house. And then it brings in the whole question of bigger radiators as well. So I just wanted Jack to comment on that. Thank you. So, so yeah, was the, was the question, it, it, is it a myth that the, the, that a house can not be suitable? Yeah, I mean, house it, most houses are suitable, but it, sort of following what I was saying about the fabric first approach, the best and most sustainable thing to do is to reduce your, your energy consumption um, to then allow for an efficient use of a, of a, of a heat pump. So if you've got a very high um, uh, heat demand in your property, so you've got solid brick walls which are uninsulated and your end of terrace or your you know detached even, um, then you're going to be losing a lot of heat from that um, from the property, and you might you might need you know even more than the largest size of heat pump that they that exist to provide um, the amount of heat. I mean, you know, this is a hypothetical situation, so I'm assuming like a large detached um, building here, but so that you, you can provide heat to any size of property with a, a bit a bigger heat pump, more heat pumps, larger surface area heat emitters, but you're not going to be doing anything particularly environmentally friendly or economically viable because the cost of running that is going to be quite high. The cost of install is going to be quite high and um, it's not going to be very sustainable. So yeah, you can, you can heat any property with, with it, but really what makes sense to get an efficient heat pump installation is to, is to focus on reducing um, the heat loss first. And um, yeah, there are sort of rules of thumb of, um, of uh, you know what levels to achieve so yeah sort of sort of like a 12 12 kilowatt um system is sort of a good uh, a good installation if you can get it even lower i think you said you had a seven kilowatt system um but yeah so that's the sort of the rating of the, the size of the heat pump sort of matches the the uh peak heat demand of the property so they're sort of directly related. Thanks. Thanks. And I think Terry has a hand up. Yep, thank you. Uh, for jo John and Anne, I'm curious about the sort of cycle with your electricity. I wonder if you can comment how much you kind of monitor it or just let it do its own thing, because clearly when it's sunshine and then you're trying to see how much the battery is charging up. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, presumably the heat pump takes far too much energy to run it just off the battery, but can, but does it, can it take what the battery and then top it up or how, I'm just interested in the sort of cycle during the day and how much you're monitoring things and whether, whether Anne's allowed to use the washing machine if it's not sunny and all that sort of stuff or <laughs> whether you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, we, we have a Tesla battery and like all things Tesla, it comes with very good software. So um, on our phones, on the app, you've got a, you can monitor it at any time and you can see exactly, you know, whether it's charging from, from the sunshine, whether it's importing or exporting, whether the house is using it at any time. And you can look back over the previous day, the previous week, the previous month uh, and see what happens. So. For, but but for we the, do abdicate responsibility to Tesla yeah, yeah. for um, when to export to the DNO and when to charge up the battery. So we have no control over that. No. They do it. Yeah, but it's um, there are probably three months in the year when we are exporting as much or more than we are using. Of course, unfortunately, in the middle of winter, when there's least sunshine, that's when we have the highest usage. So... But that's why the battery is so important because it means that we can charge the battery up from the sunshine during the day and and in the evening you know that we can use use our own power from the battery what we do also have is a particular car charger whose make i've forgotten now which allows us to directly take the energy we produce on the solar panels and directly charge the car mm. in a particular eco setting you can yeah. do that yeah. so there's stuff that we can do to use our own electricity and store it separately. There's nothing better to, than having a car fully charged from your own solar panels. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, 
Um, there was a question in the chat um, about um, how much money like the different measures um, costed. Um, and I just wonder, um, maybe Alan, if, if you wanted to, to expand on that a little bit. Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's just about um, the different measures and um, how much they cost to install uh, for you personally. Right. Well, uh, it's a dif bit difficult to separate some of it, but I would say that the we we had all the insulation done at the same time, so the external wall insulation, uh, filling the chimneys with insulation, and double glazing. Uh, I think the the external wall insulation cost about ten thousand pounds. I'm not sure whether that's uh, would still be the case now. So this was nearly 20 years ago. Um, and that gave us four inches of insulation, which is a fair amount of insulation. But you, as part of doing that, you have to move all the down pipes and extend the window sills. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes with it. Um, so that's why it's cost that much. Uh, the, um, let me think, the, the insulating under the floor cost us almost nothing because we were taking the floor up anyway. Um, if we hadn't been taking the floor up, I, uh, that was part of a, a, a major doing the house up. So um, I don't know the cost of that, but you're probably talking a few thousand. As I said before, the ventilation system, uh, I did it myself and that cost a thousand pounds in um in equipment uh in insulating the chimneys i would think that that was relatively cheap to do yourself um it's just blocking up the bottom end of the chimney and get up the top and pour a load of vermiculite in um vermiculite's not cheap but you're probably talking tens of pounds rather than thousands um, but getting up to the chimney is is an interesting challenge. Uh, so you probably, I probably would have paid a thousand pounds for a scaffolding to do that. Uh, I think that's that's most of the sort of insulation and things job. And so it's they're all they're all quite expensive. I mean the solar PV uh, when we originally did did all of that that was cost us about five thousand pounds and we've just replaced it all and that cost us uh about two thousand i think so that shows how much pv has come down in, in cost and a lot of these things are going to get cheaper as people as, as the contractors get better at it and the technology improves um it'll, it'll all get cheaper i guess Well, thanks for that, Alan. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we're just going to share some uh, ways that you can contact us. Um, so we've got like our community's email address. Um, we're also on Twitter. Um, you can like, follow us on social media um, and tag us in any things that you think we'd like to see. Um, I'd also add just our website, and um, there's quite a lot of information there on um, different uh, like retrofit measures, um, and we have fact sheets, et cetera, on there too. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, just to say that um, we will be circulating um, a recording of this webinar um, and uh, links to any useful resources after, after our last webinar, so that's on the 23rd of June, so probably in early July, um, we'll send one email out to anyone who's registered for any of the event rights. Um, just a reminder that there were two more webinars coming up, one on Monday and then the following Thursday. Um, so do look on our website for details of those. Um, and yeah, one is themed on 1970s homes and one is on 1920s, 1930s homes. Um, and uh, yeah, we just finally, we'd love to hear from you how you found the event um, and get your feedback just so we can see how we can improve the next ones. Uh, so we'd be grateful if you could take uh, five minutes to complete a survey, which should pop up when you leave the Zoom meeting. Um,